Thank you so much for your inputs. Uh, we move on to our next session. I'm sorry we're running a little late. This is the education panel, what's going on in the classroom or not. May I please request the panelists to come up on stage? So while they're getting mic'd up, let me take this opportunity to introduce our moderator, Amitav Virmani. Uh, Amitav is a country director, Absolute Return for Kids, India, a UK-based charitable organization founded in 2002. He's responsible for setting up and managing the India operations for ARC. Uh, he and his team are responsible for launching several programs in India, School Leaders for India, a leadership capacity building program, Aspire, an English literacy program, Enable, a vouchers school access program, and Equips, a school quality assessment initiative. Over the last year, he's been involved with the Delhi state government to consider formation of policy around public-private partnerships for school management. He's worked as a general manager in the office of the CEO and MD at Ranbaxy Laboratories prior to his switch over at, in the development sector. Uh, there's, there's this whole bio that he's, he's had a long, long list of accomplishments. I'm not reading that. You have it in front of you. Just one more thing I want to point out. Amitav and Ananta Center go a long way before. He's a member of the ILI, the India Leadership Initiative, and he's also an Aspen Fellow of the third batch. And over to you, Amitav. Thank you. This one? Okay, great. Uh, firstly, I'd like to welcome the panelists. Um, we're going to do this slightly differently from the way we've done the other panels. Um, we'll start with a short movie clip. I'm sure half the audience here has probably seen this, but I thought it would be a good starting point. It will also sort of wake you up post-lunch. Um, I'm going to share a little bit on the statistics that at least I'm aware of. Uh, I think some of them were shared during the movie this morning, but it's important to reiterate some of that, just to kind of bring it to life. And I want to share a couple of personal stories as well related to uh, this particular subject. And uh, then I'm going to request some comments and questions from the audience members, because I don't think we've had enough interaction with the audience. So I'd like to maybe call on some people and maybe uh, ask some people to make some comments. And then we'll go into some remarks from the uh, panelists. Uh, so if that is OK with everyone, then can we just play the clip, please? So hopefully, uh, I don't know how many of you have seen this before. And if you were able to connect with what was going on, it's just a short clip of a movie. Um, but essentially, this is what we've been talking about the whole day, <clears throat> right? And if you look at uh, what we've been talking about in terms of ending sexual violence, if I were to use some of those statistics um, that have come out of a study that was conducted in 2007 by three leading NGOs, UNICEF, Save the Children, and Prayas, I think the numbers are staggering. Uh, just to kind of maybe give you some of those numbers, 37% of women in India are, are abused by their husbands. Not abused outside, but abused by their husbands. 51% of men and 54% of women feel that men are justified in hitting their wives. 52% of adolescent females and 57% of adolescent males feel it is justified to abuse their spouse. This is before they've gotten into 
a marital relationship. 53% of children in India face child sex abuse and only 6% of those 53% report it, right? And 50% of those 53% are in some sort of a relationship with their abuser, so either a relative or someone in their circle of trust. Surprisingly, 49% of those abused are boys. So while we've been talking about women and girls, boys are at risk as well. Andhra Pradesh, Assam, Bihar, and Delhi rank highest amongst sex abuse. 49% of the girls in this study wish they were boys. I want to share a personal story, hopefully it will put it in context. If we're talking about 53% of those people who justify or feel that it's justified to abuse their spouse, that's half of us sitting in this room. I want to share a personal story about a close relative without naming that person or telling you what my relation is with that person. This person has been in a marital relationship, of course, for the last 30 plus years has had physical abuse and sexual abuse on them for the last 30 years. The husband has been in eight extramarital affairs. She continues to face this abuse on a regular basis. Of course, I'm very close to her, so she confides in me. She's desperate to get out of that relationship, but has no avenue. She has children to support. She has a house to run, she has no house of her own, and society will not accept her or her children if she leaves. I struggle every day to give her my advice. I don't have any. That's just one story. I'm hoping that today, over the next 45 minutes, we can share a little bit more about what we've experienced, either in a personal life, or in the workplace setting, or at school, or at home. I think the options are limitless, right? We're seeing it everywhere. So I want to start. Um, I know there's some students in the audience who I was having a very nice conversation with over lunch, prior to lunch. Um, I'd, I'd really appreciate it if you can stand up and tell us a little bit about what is happening in school with regard to what we're talking about today. You may call it sex education in school. You may call it social awareness. However, this is happening in the classroom. Before I go to our expert panel, panelists, I'd love to hear from some of the students. And you promised me you'd speak when we spoke at lunch. So <laughs> feel free to, and I know you have your teachers and your principals here, but for today, they're just your colleagues. Great, excellent, thank you. If you can just tell us your name and your school, and then if you have a comment or a question or an experience related to uh, ending sexual violence and what you know about it and what's happening in school specifically <coughs> with regard to this subject. Thank you. Hey, um, I'm Nikhil, uh, this is Anushka, this is Siddharth, we're from the Shiram School. And uh, we'll, we'd all like to share our bit about sexual violence. Siddharth will kick it off and then we'll continue. Sure. Um, our school has been quite brilliant in addressing the issue of sexual violence. I mean, from junior school itself, we'll ha we had our grown growing up workshops, our adolescent workshops, which is age appropriate sex education. Um, we were told about good touch, bad touch, personal space, and all this. I mean, looking back from right now, I remember think, uh, cringing, so awkward. Uh, but looking back, I'm so thankful that our school did this for us. And it taught us so much. And it uh, inculcated a sense of gender equality that w we wouldn't have had otherwise. And even continuing into middle school and senior school, our growing up workshops changed into formal sex education. And we've even had self-defense workshops, not only for girls, but for boys as well, to help protect girls. 
So our school has done a brilliant and tremendous job in telling us about gender equality and in helping end sexual violence. Excellent, thank you. You want to add to that? Yeah, um, I'm meaning, of course, our school has done a great job of, you know, um, telling us about sex education, but that's not why we're here. We're here to find end to sexual violence. And that's a really pressing issue, not only in schools in India, but around the world. I mean, uh, around, like, there are millions of people who suffer from uh, sexual violence in schools, with most of them, uh, you know, happening in middle school. And, you know, there are, meaning there are, the statistics are staggering. In the uh, United States alone, 60% of, you know, adolescent girls from age 13 to 15 suffer sexual violence. Not all of them penetration, but mainly verbal and, you know, uh, you know verbal communication. And, you know, we have to work towards normalizing, uh, you know, uh, uh, talk of sex because, you know, Around the world, it's considered taboo to, you know, talk about sex, sexual violence, and such, uh, such actions. So uh, we have to work towards, you know, normalizing stuff like sex education because we can, from our own experience, whenever we talk about it in school, it really is taboo. You know, we get awkward and stuff. So at least that's my take on it. And thank you. Um, as um, was mentioned today in an earlier panel. Um, even if it's not a taboo and we are allowed to speak up, it's not always equal. And at least for us in school, so far it has been. And something is as appropriate coming from a boy and a girl, and we haven't had much of a distinction. We're privileged. I don't know if it's the same for all schools coming from different backgrounds, um, knowing that you know we're the, uh, some of the privileged few. It's really saddening that there's some people that don't get the same privilege, but it shouldn't be a privilege not to have violence against you. It's a right. And I think that's what we're all here today to learn, whether we're students or people that are experts in their fields. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. I know there's some uh, counselors as well who specifically are working with these kids. I, sorry, I can't see faces, but you know who you are. Yes, please. If, if you can just hand her the mic. Hi, I'm Pritha Mani. I'm from the Sri Ram School, Vasan Vihar. So I work with the young kids with junior school. So like um, one of the kids said, we do do growing up workshops for the kids. We talk about boundaries, ownership of one's own body, um, the power to say no. We work on, I had a group of students who were talking about safety and were concerned. So together we developed their own Bill of Rights, um, which they signed and they wrote what they did, the right to be believed, the right to say no, the right to personal space. We also have a bullying, anti-bullying task force, which extends you know, into sexual violence to violence itself. And what I'm trying to do and what we've got teachers to do is to inculcate that into the curriculum. Our second phase is to talk about growing up and make it a curriculum-based thing rather than just focusing on what we do now is grade fives and grade eights. We want it from nursery. We've spoken to the principal and director to change the terms from good touch, bad touch to either safe or unsafe or comfortable or uncomfortable because we felt that it, the words bad was very, um, it was not a good terminology because a child might be stimulated and might not know the difference. Mm -hmm. So lots of ways we're working with the students in terms of sensitizing to teachers as well. Um, I think one kid, some one of the child says that teachers put on their own judgments when it comes to sexuality, you know, and limited conversations. So what we're trying to tell teachers is use proper terminology, open the doors to communication. Um, I've told teachers what kind of questions they can ask to open that facilitate that discussion so kids can approach you and they don't feel ashamed about it. Great, thank you. So that's you. what we're doing right now. Thank you. Can maybe take one or two more comments and or uh, questions? Yeah, I, I see two hands, so let's just take those two. Oh. Hi, I'm Manju, I'm a creative movement therapist and uh, we do a lot of uh, work with school and college students on gender and sexual behavior and um, sexual and reproductive health. And uh, I have worked uh, with government schools, Kendra Vidyalayas in Delhi, 
uh, it was a pilot project by Ministry of HRD. And uh, it was amazing that those kids uh, did not even know the, uh, you know, names of the sexual organs, some of them. And till class 12, uh, even though they have a biology chapter and biology subject, but there were a lot of things they did not know, which, you know, normally we know. And, um, uh, you know, so uh, we used to emphasize a lot on respect towards one's, uh, one's own body as well as body of the opposite gender. And um, I, I would like to share one example that I share it with everybody that uh, you have a piece of chocolate and it's your favorite chocolate with how many people would you like to share that? And the kids would say that uh, maximum with a best friend but not more than that. So then you, when you give these kind of examples and then relate back to the love for your own body and lo uh, respect for the others, then we would say that, so how easy is it to share your body with somebody when you don't know whether that person respects your body or whether you respect your body and whether you respect the other person's body. So a lot of those things, so, uh, you know, Shuram school is privileged and the students are privileged that they're getting these uh, you know, people are talking about these issues and school is doing a lot of interventions, but it's a sad scene in the government sector. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. There was one more hand here. Sorry, I'll come back to you at the end. We need to get the panelists as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I work for an institute, an NGO called SETPA, and we are working in government schools. So working in 1,428 schools in Jharkhand, about 809 in Bihar, and 12 private schools in Delhi. And I have just two messages. One, despite what people in this room think, or we think we know, acceptance of introducing such programs, such topics in schools are very, very low. Yep. Um, I think about 80% of government schools don't have any kinds of life, schools or life skills or adolescent education. The, the last time when NDA was in power, they banned, quote unquote, sex education in 12 states in the country. And even today, five states have banned this kind of education in school. Mm -hmm. So my first message is that we cannot be complacent. We really have to push for the need of introducing such content, such topics in schools. Mm -hmm. So we are not there yet. Mm -hmm. Number two, also this realization that in-school programs are not going to solve all our problems. Mm -hmm. You know, we have seen in the last seven years, we have had annual evaluations. We have seen that children's knowledge, of course, improves. Their attitudes also change. But it's easier to change attitudes in certain aspects and not so much in certain other aspects. To give you an example, if you talk of stigma against a person who's HIV positive, you will see a very sharp movement, a positive movement. But when you ask questions around gender equity, you ask questions in a roundabout way. You ask, do you think a family must have a boy? There's hardly any change. Mm -hmm. Because that's the social conditioning which is working. Mm -hmm. So in-school programs are great, but if it is not happening side by side with social changes, then we are not there yet. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. I think that's a great segue to get our expert panelists to give their comments. And the way I'd like to do this is um, maybe start with Manika. Manika, of course, as you know, is the director of the Sri Ram schools, one of the leading schools of the country. They've been ranked amongst the top performing schools since 2008. Um, about 4,000 children across your three campuses um, and very well regarded school. And Manika has, of course, been dealing with kids of all ages for the last so many years. So I want to start with you, Manika, specifically with regard to what are you seeing out there on a day-to-day -day basis that is worrisome? You know, so what, are there any specific uh, indicators or telltale signs that sexual violence is a problem and it's brewing? Um, it starts with small things at school and then grows to become much bigger acts of sexual violence as you grow older. So I want to get your perspective on that, and then I'll ask the speakers to build on it. Thanks, Amitav, and uh, can you hear me? Yeah. And thanks my students first. You were wonderful. Actually, you are, you can't hear, right? Mic is not working. Is that okay now? Just turn the mic the other way. Audible? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you, children. You are our ambassadors, and half the questions have already been answered, actually, Amitabh. 
Okay, I'll take you back to a school situation. You know, uh, the most critical thing in a school is uh, orientation of all the stakeholders. And when I say that, I mean parents, teachers, new teachers who join us, and students. What happens in most schools is that um, too much emphasis is not laid on uh, what are the expectations of teachers. So for instance, I'd like to quote something here, and I know I have some colleagues in the audience. Uh, we have a very clearly articulated sexual harassment policy in school. I was talking to some other principals, and they were quite surprised that, and this is not recent. This is not post Nirbhaya. It was there for many, many years. And uh, every year when the school term kicks off, uh, we have 500 plus staff, and even last year, July, 1st of July, we got the staff together, and we shared the policy with each and every member. It's well articulated. The policy is for, uh, for staff and students. Um, so coming back to answer your question, I, we think it's critical that there's an understanding and an orientation towards what expectations are. In a school scenario, it's really hard because you have children of all ages and you do lean on uh, the bhaiyas and the didis, you know, and who don't necessarily come from backgrounds where there's education. So they escort children on buses. Of course, the teachers are there, but then there is a lot of dependency in, 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 in our country. Uh, I, I can quote an incident here, which was quite horrific for us, actually. And uh, the child hadn't been sort of, and that's when I bring in the stakeholders. And this child was all of four and a half, and he hadn't been uh, toilet trained. A very pampered child. You know, the parents that thought that, no, he's not going to touch himself. He doesn't need toilet training sent to a big school, you know, packed off to a big school, but not toilet trained. So uh, he visited the toilet and uh, he didn't know how to do, he didn't know how to help himself, he didn't know how to tie his button, he didn't know what to do. Uh, so obviously, he, the, uh, this is a little boy and the Didi was called for and when uh, he went to the loo and he had to be washed, uh, he had to be washed. Um, he came back and because of what the children spoke about the orientation and safe touch and good touch and you know all of that what even Pritha spoke, the children were aware that the teacher has told them that if you don't feel good come back. That came from the teacher but unfortunately not from home. So the child came and told the teacher I didn't like the way he washed me. He kept on holding his finger there, I didn't like it you know. So the teacher immediately got in touch with the family and brought the parents in. And obviously, uh, next day it was in the papers because, you know, it traveled like that. And we, we were open because we were an educational institution. I didn't see where the point was of actually shoving things under the carpet. It was all about, you know, creating safe spaces for students. So, I mean, I don't know if that answers no, you. Sure. But as, as a school, we are very committed. Sure. And I think all schools, and I like the point about the government schools because if you don't understand terminology, if you don't tell tell children what the anatomy parts are, what do you call them, what's their name, how are they called, uh, they won't know. Yeah. It's all about educating our children. Thank you. Let, let me just sort of ask Rukmini, and everyone knows Rukmini, but just to quickly introduce, Rukmini has been working with, I don't think this is working, um, at Pratham, one of the founding members of Pratham, the leading NGO in, in, in India, and uh, most recently over the last six years has been leading the Asar Center, which is the annual status of education. Um, so Rukmani works with about how many million children? 20 or 30. No, no, no. Um, the numbers are huge. And I think it's, it, uh, from my perspective, Rukmani, I'd, what I'd like to really ask you is that uh, in both at the workplace, Pratham has several thousand people now working in the form of volunteers and employees, um, but also your work with children. What are you seeing and what is it that you propose to do specifically in regard to ending sexual violence, either at the workplace, because you're working with so many people that you are not directly connected with, or um, what are you picking up from children, either out of school, in school, behaviors that you see, patterns that may be emerging? Uh, you know, I'd like to get your thoughts on that. So I think uh, two clear things. One, following up from what uh, Manika said, I think there is a now a sexual harassment act and uh, we have used that as an opportunity to actually bring some of the discussion around these issues, at least with all the adults. Uh, we work very widely across India, in many rural areas, a lot of young people whose first jobs or tasks or assignments are with us. It's often the first time they've left home. And we find that it's a very useful uh, way to actually start discussions on some of these 
issues which as the children said are often awkward, they haven't been talked about. Uh, and we find that in many, many uh, such instances, uh, you know, what exactly is sexual harassment? I mean, I'm not even talking about violence, but the fact that the definitions of sexual harassment, the examples of what kind of behaviors could constitute that actually is very eye-opening for many people. Mm -hmm. So with the adults, we think that this could be widely used uh, for just actually bringing about uh, A, a platform on which you can talk about these things, B, sending a message that the leadership is very uh, committed to uh, equality and you know, lack of fear in the workplace, and also creating a platform where if something should go wrong, you know who to come to, you know there is a process, and that it's okay to come and talk about it. So that's what I would say about the adults. And I think this needs to be done more and more, and I find personally the more, more I do it, I find it easier to do the next sure. one. So I think as a big organization or as a society, the more we actually talk about these things, the more it's gonna be easy to talk about. Mm -hmm. As far as the children go, we work mainly with primary school children, and I'd like to sort of continue from what uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, ladies in the audience spoke. Uh, our basic work with kids is really to work on reading, comprehension, basic communication. I think that to be able to get to talk about things that matter, you have to first encourage the culture of talk. In many of the schools, we work very large, we work only with government schools in many states. There is a very different communication style in schools where there is, it's very teacher driven, uh, very textbook oriented, both for teachers and children, that's how you go. And so how do you bring about a uh, practice of saying, after I've read, we can discuss, actually even before you've read, you can discuss. How do you bring about places where it is okay to disagree with each other? Uh, I'll give you one little example. This was uh, last summer, we were doing a summer camp in uh, Junjunu district, where Pilani is. And we had, very unusually for us, kids from 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th. We usually work with much younger kids. And these were kids who were from about 10 schools who were coming to this summer camp. And rather than calling it any kind of education, we really wanted to get into, can you have a discussion? Can you get into a group, disagree, come to an agreement that these are the different points of disagreement and present your case and present your arguments? And we used that forum actually to talk more about, I would say, gender issues rather than about violence. You know, here's a brother and a sister, this is what their family is like, the brother decides to do this, the sister is prevented from doing that. As a group, what do you think? We used actually the same format to talk about caste issues as well, mm -hmm. which is another thing that is not very easy to talk about. Sure. It took a good week for the groups, firstly for the boys and girls to be in the same group together. Mm -hmm. It took a little bit longer for the girls to voice their opinions loud enough. Mm -hmm. But what we found is that if the platform is created mm -hmm. and is supported and there is consistency, then many of these things begin to happen. So my point would be that we really need to create within schools, and I agree, everything can, can't be done within school, mm -hmm. but it's much more difficult to directly approach the homes of all the students that mm -hmm. come to school. Mm -hmm. But if you start the culture in the school, mm -hmm. it's okay to talk about some things, sure. it's okay to disagree, sure. it's okay to argue. Sure. Surprisingly, despite being argumentative Indians, we don't do these things in school. We do it at home, perhaps. Uh, that, that's where this, you know, this critical approach of whatever I'm, I'm seeing, is that right or wrong? Can I discuss it? Can I debate it? Mm -hmm. I think very widely that needs to be done in schools. Mm -hmm. Great. I think, Rukmini, you've also uh, gone to my phase two of this panel where I want to get to solutions. So I'll come back to a, a specific question on how we might be able to do some of what you've just said, but thanks for that. Uh, I want to go to Dr. Samir, who is at the Max uh, Healthcare Hospital. And uh, I think he wears two hats. One is, of course, he's heading the practice on mental health and behavioral sciences, uh, which I also want to question him on. But he's actively engaged with multiple schools on the Rashtriya Madhmik Shiksha Abhiyan scheme by the government, um, specifically running some programs at schools uh, related to uh, you know, mental health and, and behavior in general. So uh, Samir, I, I, specifically the question I want to ask you is twofold. One is what you're seeing in hospital what you're seeing at the, uh, you know, um, at Max. Um, are you getting cases, and you know, uh, pardon me for my ignorance here, but the, the famous, in, sort of famous debate by Sigmund Freud on nature versus nurture, where, where is the line when it comes to 
you know, sexual violence and where is the, how does a person's personality develop over time? Are they born uh, a, a perpetrator or do they eventually become one or is it a combination of the two? And how do you pick up early signs of something like that, whether in hospital or in the work you're doing in school? Amitabh, I think you put the perspective in place. And I think it's a very, very thin line, a very sensitive and a very fine line that differentiates. Uh, nobody is born a perpetrator, let me put it like that. But yes, you are born with certain genes, and those genes do define your temperament. Now, when I was studying medicine, I was taught that you have genetic factors to problems, and then you have environmental factors that contribute to it. And we thought that they are two different clusters, and they don't merge. But when I started thinking and seeing and learning further, I realized that there's not very clear demarcation between your genes and the environment. I'll give you an example. Say over generations, over years, maybe we had those very sharp canine teeth when we were flesh eaters. And over a period of time, the canine teeth have become blunt. Mm -hmm. So somewhere down the line, the environment, the way we dealt with ourselves, the kind of food habits that we engaged in, did influence our genes and what we passed on to subsequent generations. So I think there's not a significant difference between environment and genes because each influences the other. Then when we come to the school versus the clinic environment, like you said, I don't think so. There's a very clear demarcation there because what when you see in clinics, I also see patients coming from schools. Mm -hmm. I see uh, persons narrating their histories when they were in schools mm -hmm. or they were young or they were at home. Mm -hmm. And I think school is a window of uh, the society. Mm -hmm. And what happens in school is reflected in your subsequent behavior mm -hmm. because the teacher's word is the final word at times. Mm -hmm your interaction with other fellow colleagues. Mm -hmm. Again, you imbibe many factors from there. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult to demarcate those issues. But when we talk about any perpetrator, try to understand the biological factors. We talk about certain areas of the brain mm -hmm. which are maybe hyperfunctioning and certain areas of the brain which are hyperfunctioning. Mm -hmm. So we say the temporal lobe of the brain, which is responsible for emotions and regulation of emotions is somewhat hyperfunctioning. Mm -hmm. And then the control of emotions that comes through the frontal lobe of the brain, which is right sitting ahead, is somewhat getting loose. Mm -hmm. So when the permission is not being sought before any behavior, then you become more violent, you become more aggressive, you're not able to control your emotions the way you should. Mm -hmm. And those are areas which are more biological. But simultaneously, there's a significant role of the environment. And I think that contributes the major chunk because behaviors, a part of it is inborn, innate, but most of it is learned. And behaviors can be both learned and unlearned. I think you need proper systems in place, whether we, and when I talk about systems, I'm not just talking about the structures in place. Mm -hmm. You've had many policies mm -hmm. in place for many years, mm -hmm. but then there are things which go un undiagnosed, unreported. Mm -hmm. So there are many ways of finding mm -hmm. those issues and identifying those issues very quick. Mm -hmm. uh, when we talk about children, or any person as, at large, uh, most of the communication happens through body language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Words come later, sure. and physical acts come much later. Right. So when we are talking about physical acts, that's a very minor chunk. Mm -hmm. But majority of us face a very negative body language mm -hmm. from many other people in the world. Right. So when we narrow down to basic concepts in learning, I think whether it is at school level, whether it, has, it, it, is, it is at home, mm -hmm. we have to deal with concepts like empathy, like respect for self and others, like creating a s space for oneself and others. I think those are values which need to be imbibed in time and coming to the kind of curriculum that was flowing from the floor. Mm -hmm. I would absolutely agree with this fact, wherein the teachers themselves are very uncomfortable teaching such issues which are so very sensitive. At times there's a giggle in the class and they don't know how to manage that giggle. But I think if it is started from early years in a very age appropriate, and sensitively handled manner for which we'll have to train the resources, I think most of it can be dealt with. At least people would start voicing. There are very, very fine ways of identifying, even before letting the child know about the touch part, there are many ways of identifying whether a person is going through sexual abuse or any kind of such uncomfortable uh, situation. It is, it is through the flow of body language, the kind of toys that children play with at times they avoid touching those areas, or at times they become too inquisitive to touch those areas in the toy, uh, which, which perhaps reflect some, some kind of a sexual conflict in the mind. It also reflects in the way the child withdraws 
from the society or perhaps from the family members with the eye contact goes amiss with the family members. So there are many ways in the kind of play that the child engages in, the kind of drawings that the child draws, there are many ways to kind of find out those issues provided there's a will, there's the time, and there's the sensitive eye to kind of find those. I'm going to, I'm going to come back to the panelists once again. Uh, let me go to Bindya. But specifically when I come back, I want you to just think while you have the time is how we're fitting all of what we're saying into education. And I think education is broad. It doesn't mean just school, right? It's <coughs> much larger than that. It's at home. It's the society. It's school. Um, it's basically awareness building as well, right? And what are, if we can pinpoint some solutions, and I will turn to the floor as well, because most of us are so closely connected to this particular subject, and I'm sure you'll have some solutions there. So coming to Bindya, um, Bindya is currently at Room to Read and working on the girls' education program. Um, she works with about 6,000 girls specifically across six states, and they work with government schools. So hopefully we'll get, get the government school perspective from a live program in some of the uh, issues that were highlighted earlier. So Bindya, if you can just share uh, your experiences. So I think, like Amitav, you mentioned that 53% of our children, they experience social, uh, sexual violence in some form or the other, which means one in every two children, in fact, has faced some form of uh, sexual harassment or violence. So, you know, we are dealing with girls who are in the age group of 12 to 18 years on an average and, uh, you know, working in six states, which means we, have, uh, we are uh, working with the girls who are uh, situated or located in the urban context as well as the rural context. They are, in, uh, you know, the states that we cover are, gives us uh, experience from northern states as well as southern states. We are reaching to girls who are, uh, in, you know, belonging to marginalized communities, Dalit community, uh, minorities so you know why uh, I mean I'm talking about these is to tell you that the incidences of violence are so common so rampant across all these categories it is not specific to one group or one area per se and the forms that we have seen or uh, you know that our girls have experienced one is that of course incest you know, the family member attempting to uh, for uh, attempting for sexual violence sexual based violence or abuses and taking advantage of the situation so that that is very common you know and the perpetrators include uh, as we have seen in the movie also and in our discussions we are hearing they are like in our experience 99% of the time they are the people who are actually related to girls um, in fact in the immediate family fathers stepfathers brothers uh, there are um, friends' fathers, you know, or rickshaw puller who are, you know, daily involving in, in the daily commute with the girls. Those are the people, stepfathers. So the, these are the people, brother-in-laws, who are actually engaging in these kind of, uh, you know, heinous acts with, with these girls. So, and there are no, you know, defined laws or processes to act upon these, but these girls are experiencing them, and they are not occasional incidents that are happening. These are, you know, uh, multiple years they are continuing before they, uh, they come to uh, our notice. Uh, rape, again, you know, we have had incidences, unfortunately, where the girls have been raped by their fathers or uncles, and they eventually they got pregnant also, which was a very critical case uh, that happened. Uh, I also want to, you know, specifically touch about the cases of abuse that are happening in the schools. So we have had heard from the girls where are the teachers in the school they are uh, you know putting their hands in the pockets of uh, of the girl students they are actually fondling with their private parts they are act they are going on threatening the girls that if they inform anyone about this incident then they will make sure that the girls do not continue to you know come to the computer classes or continue to get their education uh, you know uh, uh, they they don't get to retain in the school there are teachers who are actually, you know, uh, in, in a very indecent way, hugging girls, pressing, pressing their bodies against the girls. So they are, you know, on the computers, they are showing some porn material, trying to show some porn material to the girls. So these are things that are happening in the school itself. And when we talk of, you know, leadership, of course, here we have uh, schools or uh, students who have the uh, fortune of you know having a leader who is conscious who is working on the areas where you know to have a, a policy in place but in these schools most of the principals that we have you know talked to during our baseline they do not have any idea of you know whether a code of conduct should exist 
uh, or whether there are such cases happening, how they are dealing with it, there is just no information available or rather no willingness to talk on, on these aspects uh, at the school level. I will also uh, like to touch upon the incidences of early marriage, you know, which is giving legitimacy uh, to the sexual violence that happens within, within the uh, walls of homes. So we uh, have had around 17% of our girls dropping out from education program because they got married at an early age. So they got married, they were, start, they were staying at their parents' uh, place, their natal home, until the Ghana happened. And then, you know, during that phase, in, uh, in between, they go to their in-laws' place and then they come back, they get pregnant. And our school systems are not ready, you know, not ready to accommodate girls who are, you know, different. So when they come back, they have to follow certain cultural practices in terms of, you know, putting bindi or sindoor. And then they, when they come to school, uh, there is a stigma attached to it. Girls, other girls see them as different. And there are sometimes, you know, made fun, uh, these things are made fun of. So they get discouraged to attend schools. Uh, if, if pregnancy happens, then all the more difficult uh, for them to continue the school. So, you know, these are, the, these are uh, some of the ways in which we have seen that sexual violence or harassment is happening, if teasing. I mean, in Indian context, we, have, we take, it, uh, take it as very lightly and, you know, from boys or males' perspective, it is a fun thing to do. We have been talking about it uh, since yesterday. Uh, but, you know, in our experience, we have seen 100% of the girls have faced this uh, the, uh, teasing thing, why coming to school or going back. There, we have been working in some uh, locations which are like, you know, schools are 12 kilometers far from their homes. So they have to travel long distances. And while on the way, there are drivers, there are laborers who are attacking girls, who are passing lewd comments. Uh, there are boys who are offering them gifts, uh, trying to, you know, uh, 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 trying to attack them, assault them. So these girls are frightened, you know, and they are not even willing to tell this to their parents because they think if they tell, if they inform, the parents would say, okay, sit at home. It's better that, you know, you sit at home and be safe rather than getting into this sort of a trouble. So these are the situations which are actually happening across, you know, these states. And in fact, like I said, uh, and uh, we've been discussing here, they, are, they become irregular. That is the first indicator that we get to see. They become irregular. At times, there are health-related problems that occur. Uh, then uh, there are few girls who, because of this situation, you know, they prefer to run away. We have had a couple of cases where, you know, because being in difficult situation, they thought it's better to run away than be in the same family. And in that uh, process, they sometimes make hasty decisions. And they run away with people who are in, the, in their mid-30s and probably, you know, not the best match for the girls. So that, those sort of decision making also happens. Poor performance, then there is a stigma attached to it. One, that, you know, they are not being able to perform well because there is, uh, there, there, you know, in terms of concentration or the performance, it is deteriorating. So there is stigma attached that they are not performing well. At the same time, they are going through a, person, a trauma at a personal level. All these, you know, things combine, uh, have a combined effect on girls. And, uh, present as an obstacle to continuing their education. So here I would just like to make two points that one is that of course we are saying education, we are assuming that education is a ladder for them to move up the social hierarchy, grow in their own personal domain, but the institutions who are providing education, how safe are our institu institutions itself? How safe are those processes? You know, how uh, gender neutral are those processes? Uh, so that, that's, that's, you know, one thought that probably I would like to uh, leave with the group sure. and then we may come back. Sure. Yeah, I just, uh, maybe to move us along and kind of shift gear a little bit, um, you know, I, at least the theme what I was picking up, at least most of the panels that I've sat in on, have said that, you know, that particular subject area, for example, the law itself will not prevent, uh, you know, violence. Education itself is not the silver bullet men's attitudes might change, but that's not enough. So, you know, there is no silver bullet for us to say, this is what we do and that's the end. Clearly, everything is kind of, has to be strung together. And where I want to go from here now is on a couple of things that I just picked up on. Uh, Manika, you mentioned a very interesting thing about this boy who had the courage to speak up. And uh, because he spoke up, you took action. And I assume, you know, fired the 
the, the staff member. Now, that's, that's fantastic. Everything worked. Right? <coughs> um, I just want to tie it back here and not to pick on the students that are sitting here, but when I asked them to speak, it was an action that I requested of them, but it didn't happen instantaneously. It required another intervention by Kiran walking up to them and giving them the courage to say, it's okay to stand up and speak, and then three of them came together and they spoke. That's a lot of multiple things happening, right? Question I want to ask you is, while we are educating our children um, at school, right, is that enough? Or there has to be more that needs to take place beyond that, you know? Do we need to put them in situations intentionally and see if they, you know, almost like a mock drill, like you do a fire drill, right? You do an earthquake drill. Should you do a, a drill where a didi is told to touch a child inappropriately and see if that comes back to you? I'm just throwing it out there. I'm not saying that's the right way to do it. Sorry if I've uh, gone in a wrong direction. All I'm saying is that children will not necessarily speak up. Right, and if you want this to be prevented, you need to do more. So I just want your thoughts on that. Just two things on, uh, just two aspects. Uh, the first bit about you know Kiran going up to the students. Uh, I just like to make a comment here. The very fact that the students are here as a part of this discussion, where they're only grown-ups and people, you know, 25 and above, right? The fact that as a school we believe that. Students are actually partners in this whole process, and they have a job to do once they go back, not only to take it back to the student community, larger student community, but also to talk to the teachers about lessons learned. So uh, that's the first bit. So I seriously think it's not just in a school. Education has to be beyond school. You know, you can't just contain it within a school. There has to be uh, a sensitivity. There, ha there have to be opportunities for students. So uh, when you sp speak of, OK, uh, uh, to say that, okay, sh should you create situations where students will speak up? Situations are created through uh, very interactive assemblies, through movies. Uh, you know, I've just met uh, 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 the lady who's going to be on the next panel here, who's, who is a panelist here, who's already come and shown the movies on anger at our school. So uh, the point is, uh, as a teacher community, uh, you have to be sensitive about what is it that's plaguing today's students. Sure. You know, what is it that they need? So lessons are not about history, geography, and mathematics in the classroom. Education is much more holistic than we believe. So for a lot of schools, they sometimes ask us that, how do you manage so much, you know? How, how do you manage to do everything and yet you take the children take the board exams? But you have to ha have work around those things, right? Mm -hmm. The teachers obviously are fabulous. So they come forward. They come forward to get as much time to engage with students. So we believe in contact time. Uh, show them films, have discussions, have debates, have open houses, have circle time. You spoke, you spoke about you know, circles of trust, but uh, I'd like to go back to the school because circle times are integral, not only for students, but even staff. So with staff, we have sessions with counselors where they actually have offloading sessions. Mm. You know, who says only children, uh, students are vulnerable? Staff are equally vulnerable. Absolutely. And I'll just bring you back to one more thing. You know, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, Rukmini ji also said about, you know, uh, it has to come from the management, the school, the top level, have to understand that they believe in what everyone is, you know, the, the vision has to be one. So for instance, we could have articulated policies lying in files or lying on our desktops forever and ever, yeah? Mm -hmm. But if staff don't see you as people who take action, and if there are consequences to any behavior that's deviant or extraordinary, then staff are watching and because they're going to turn around and say, yeah, the policies exist, but who cares? Who does anything about it? You know, they're spineless. I mean, they say it, but they don't do it, right? Yeah. So uh, as top level leadership, as teachers, as educators, so we have that cash committee in school. Uh, and who says it doesn't happen in elite schools? It happens in government schools, but I'm not sitting here on a high horse and saying, no, 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 our school is not hota. You know, it's not true. You mm -hmm. know, every, <laughs> every man and woman is very vulnerable. So we have had uh, two incidents where uh, 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 male teachers, uh, you know, uh, we had an official complaint by a, a, a female staff mm -hmm. who came and said that uh, his touch was inappropriate and he didn't have to touch me, mm -hmm. you know, uh, for what? Uh, and uh, within that, evening uh, the committee was called for and people presided and we, we went back you know and got our imperative data and all of that was required and the gentleman was asked to leave mm -hmm. so that sent a very strong message mm -hmm. to the 
to the parent community who got to know, parents get to know, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and to the teacher community and to everyone around to say, if the school has a policy, they abide by it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. consequences, mm -hmm. you know, you find your solutions in the consequences that you place mm -hmm. on the table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Does that answer? Yeah, absolutely. I want to, Rukmini, I want to ask you a question which came from the floor. Actually, it was a comment that came from the floor specifically about um, this is not a priority in government and it's still considered taboo. Uh, I think that's a very important question. I mean, while, uh, you know, we are dealing with children, 85% of our children still go to government schools, right? And will continue to do so at least in the near future. Um, if that is the case and um, we are not dealing with this issue in government schools, um, then, you know, I think we're, we're not tackling the issue. So Rukmini, specifically because you advise governments, you work with governments, you, have, you know governments, the system, um, and a lot of the policy makers, I want to specifically ask you, what can we do? You know, whether a paper gets circulated from here, I'm not sure, but what can we do to make this a priority for government and to tell them why it is an important issue to consider adopting in the curriculum or within school settings? I think that uh, having worked with uh, uh, quite a few state governments and the teachers, it's n while there may be certain policy level decisions about what is okay and what's not okay, by and large I think teachers in the government school system would be quite open to new ideas and new ways of doing things if there was enough exposure to demonstrated models of things that work. I'll give you an example, a much simpler example of really being able to teach reading. Now the way our system is uh, set up, You've got to do things in a linear fashion. And if you haven't learned certain things by first or second, nobody in fourth and fifth is going to go back and teach you. However, if there are models which are working, working on scale, doable, and you have people who are willing to work with large government teams, we can see big changes that happen. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, you know, it's, I'm not saying it's an easy or a linear process. Mm -hmm. I think it's a process where a large number of people who are working perhaps in pockets in, uh, on these issues, mm -hmm. actually begin to either work together mm -hmm. or, uh, c you know, I mean, for example, whether it is room to read or whether there is others who are working, mm -hmm. there are examples which are growing mm -hmm. of how do you handle, you know, not just issues of sexual violence, but also of much broader issues of sure. equality. Sure. I want to give two examples. Yeah. Uh, we as Pratham really work on this issue of basic learning. If you don't have basic learning in place, mm -hmm. you can't build the whole edifice of education above. And for the rural, uh, for large numbers of states, mothers of children who are in school have not been to school themselves. 50% of kids who are in school today in rural India have mothers who have either been to school not at all mm -hmm. or for very few number of years. So they are able to support the process of what we see as schooling, mm -hmm. but not what it means to support kids in learning. Mm -hmm. This is a little, I mean, it's a little sure, bit sure, tangential sure. to what we are saying, but I think you'll see the point. Sure. So we worked with a, a large, about four, five hundred villages in Rajasthan and in Bihar, in areas where the female illiteracy levels were very high. Mm -hmm. And we worked with mothers of children who were between four and eight. So these were kids who were either in Anganwadi or going up to second standard. And the idea was how do you help these kinds of mothers to actually participate in not just the schooling part, which means going to functions, going to meetings, but actually in able to support children's learning. And one of the first things that was quite noticeable is when you actually started doing kind of literacy and engagement activities with mothers, the whole village laughed. So people would say, Isko padha ke kya hoga? Ye to mahila hai. which is okay, the village laughing is one thing. But the children would often say, Meri mammi ko kyo pada rahe ho? Wo to kuch nahi kar sakti hai. Mm. Now, if you don't have a relationship between mothers and children, mm. I mean, I'm not saying that the children don't love their mothers, mm -hmm. but they feel that in this department, mein na, Meri mammi kuch nahi kar pahe. Right. <laughs> Unko likhne ke liye mat ko, Meri mammi ko likhna nahi aata hai. Right. Now, how do you bridge this? Because until the mother is yep. seen, at least by small children, as a person who is worthy of respect mm -hmm. on some fundamental issues, mm -hmm. And therefore, it was very important for us in this particular program to really have the women succeed. Sure. Because A, everybody was watching. Sure. And more than that, the children were watching. Sure. And as soon as the mothers went beyond a certain literacy and numeracy level, the pride with the children was very high. Exactly. So I think, you know, one is education is not the curriculum and not just the textbook, yeah. which in large parts of our schools, that's what it becomes. I think yeah. that's what you're saying. We need to go beyond, beyond that. that. Absolutely. And then, 
there are many people who would like to be more engaged, but it's not clear how to do it. Yeah. And I think these things need to begin on platforms which are easier to make. And yeah. once your stage is made, you can do many more things on it. Sure. So we have this school management committee kind of thing in all government schools. It's currently a very nominal, formal thing. Mm -hmm. But wherever we can work more widely with the parent community, mm -hmm. it will take time. Mm -hmm. But I think that these kinds of things are really worth investing in. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. do teacher training for 20 days for every government school teacher, mm -hmm. not even half a day for parents. Mm -hmm. And yet it's the parents who have not really been to school and teachers are mm -hmm. you know, trained and retrained many times. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you bring in the fact that parents are really important, yep. they need to be taken along on this ride. Number two, the ride is not just the textbook, the yep. ride is a broader set of issues. Yep. And within our own classroom practices, whether in a private school or in a government school, yep. how can there be more discussion? Yes. How can there be more disagreement? Yep. And how can we as people who are part of this yep. be able to handle diversity of opinion? Yes. I think there are, these are some of the more fundamental things before or alongside dealing with much more tougher issues which sure. will polarize, sure. you know, uh, situation. Sure. Not to skip Bindya and Samir, but I've been given the five minute warning and I promise to come back to the floor. I think, yes, I will come to you. I just, the point I wanted to make on Rukmini, and if you can add to that, because she said education is not about the curriculum in the classroom, it's beyond that. I'd love to get comments just to stay on that point. If there is anyone who wants to add to that, there's a lot of people who want to add to that. Let's just go with the comment here. I will come back to you. Could you take the mic, sir? Sure. Uh, yeah, so having a subject on, uh, it could be about child sexual abuse or it could be about sexual and reproductive health and all of that. But a small exercise that we did through our work where young boys looked at the school curriculum, there were so many gender stereotypes within the textbooks right from the first grade. And that's where you, ca you cannot have a subject because it's starting right from the uh, very, very young age. And just adding to that in terms of role of parents, uh, often when we hear examples of parents and working with parents is often working with mothers. And we're not engaging fathers in that conversation, or very, very few people are. Mm -hmm. And if any of the panelists have experience of working with fathers or very engaging fathers, it would be great to hear some examples from that. Sure, okay, let's just take the two comments on this table. They'll probably answer that. Yeah, <laughs> could you just? If you can just introduce yourself, your name, your organization, and keep your comment or question very brief. So Good evening, can... everyone. Oh, it's been sheer pleasure to be a part of this. I'm Simran Binra. I teach sociology in the Sri Ram School, at the Sri Ram School. Mostly, m mostly questions have been answered, but because I teach sociology, and I'm lucky that my subject lends itself to so much more beyond the syllabi. But the question, I'm just going to do short pointers. Question is, what is the syllabi? and how do we go beyond it? The other thing is when we spoke of taboos and we spoke of um, visual exposure of, uh, to children of the immediate environment which they can't translate sometimes, especially in rural India. Uh, even if I look at our own children and when we see them, they don't understand what sexual violence is because people who are low on self-esteem, so I'm going to the sociological aspect which translates translate itself in the biology of it, just to feel wanted, Sometimes they're okay if somebody's approaching them or misusing them or abusing them sexually because for them, they're just being wanted for something. The self-esteem is so low. And if you don't work in all this, if you don't work on self-esteem to interpret sexual violence, to understand your feelings for it and to raise a voice will be very difficult. So self-esteem is one thing I think we need to work through the ages, even for adults who are low in self-esteem, who let themselves get abused sometimes a little more easily than others. Sure. And the other thing which uh, I wanted to say was before the Nirbhaya case and generally, you know, we have certain sections of our country like the Northeast and other sections which are a little different from us here. Yeah. And if they, if those people feel marginalized because you see, Northeast, if you see girls, a lot of them always are in Western outfits. And somehow a lot of times when they come to the other mainstream areas, people say, oh, they're easy, they're too forward, they're too broad-minded, look at what they wear, look how they walk out with boys, and they become easy targets to sexual violence just because 
there's a contrast to how we keep some women in parda and some others are walking on the streets wearing what they want and they look okay in it but they are victims mm -hmm. so there is issues like thank you the, the comment there a question yeah good afternoon everyone i'm uh, florence joseph from uh, representing shri ram school aravalli branch uh, i teach chemistry but i'm also the leadership coordinator in the school uh, I would like to second Ms. Rukmini uh, Vihya, where she said that it's really important to uh, give a platform to communicate and for the children to discuss the brainstorm issues. And as Laura said yesterday, you know, that this should be a forum where we look for solutions. We know problems galore, but what is it that we do and what has been successful for us? So I would like to say something that has worked really well in Shriram School. It's not that we just implement one thing and just stay put over there. Uh, we revisit it every year and see what worked, what did not work. So we've got a dynamic, uh, you know, uh, like kind of discussion amongst the staff members and we take forward the same thing to our students. Uh, so what we do is uh, we have interwoven it in our timetable itself. So every Tuesday, the last period is set apart for this kind of a break brainstorming within the class and we alternate between a, you know a mentoring session or it could be a life skill session or a leadership session and the topics that we handle are really very interesting and which uh, which are really pertinent so for example last tuesday we started off with the mentoring session where the objective was every class needs to have its own set of rules you know it could be different for every class and every level so we don't make it like dry like what are the rules for your class mm -hmm. so we come from what is the importance of a boundary you see, we start off like that. So like, for example, in my class, I said, why do you think you need a boundary in a cricket field? They said, ma'am, unless we have a boundary, how do we know whether the person has scored a sixer or a four, you know? <laughs> and then we had a good discussion. And finally, we came to a conclusion, yes, boundary is really important. But I had a very smart child in my class. He said that, ma'am, I don't agree. I said, why don't you agree? He said, and how do I say, think out of the box? <laughs> uh, so I have a physics teacher who is with me. She said, look, that box is a boundary. If that box wasn't there, you wouldn't have a phrase like thinking out of the boundary, you know? So these kind of dynamics go on yeah. inside the class. And, uh, you know, uh, yesterday I was traveling back with if my I student. If I can just request you to keep your comments at least yes. if I know that. Sure, you. sure. I'll just finish it quickly. Uh, so it's if you've got a particular objective, you know, be creative. For example, Anushka said that, ma'am, if we talk about sex in the class, I think we should do it. So I said, what was the broader, you know, outline? She said, consent. Talk about consent, you know, because if somebody is speaking to me, yep. I might keep moving back. Yep. That's an indication for me that, okay, that's my boundary. Yep. So I think we can start off from something so. and go into it deeper, and it just depends on the class dynamics, and we can handle every issue. And I think, Rukmini, ma'am, whatever you said is important. I think communication Thank is really you. important. Thank you Thank so you. much. Yeah. Can you just pass the mic here? I'll take two more questions, and then we'll try and wrap this up. There's one here. You had your hand up, sir. Do you still have a question? This is yours, fine. So we'll take one here, one here, and then I'll ask this yeah. question. Yeah, um, I am Swami, Country Director, uh, Ethnic Minority Foundation is an NGO. We are working with about 1,500 slum children. We run schools for them. Mm -hmm. We call them as intercultural, intersocial schools. Mm -hmm. We don't have age bar. Mm -hmm. 12, 12 years boy can be in the first standard, mm -hmm. and uh, a four years boy could be in the in other class. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of school we run. And we don't develop any curriculum with our uh, preconceived notions, mm -hmm. but we go to the community, we go to the children, uh, and ask what they want to learn, mm -hmm. apart from you know, normal things. Sure. But we also discuss certain issues. We call them as life education you know, uh, subjects. Mm -hmm. They talk about uh, women's safety, you know, health, these things. Mm -hmm. So in that, I think I agree with these two panel members that we should look beyond the formal you know, your curriculum that is given by government or somebody, but let us evolve the syllabus, evolve the subjects from the community, from the people, sure. so that people take the ownership. Sure. I think in that perspective, I would like the panel to add more value, so sure. that that could be really institutionalized, and then there should be some proper thinking at the policy level. Sure, sure. I'm going to just ask one last question specifically, which has come for Dr. Samir. Um, which says, do you suggest inclusion of emotional intelligence as part of the curriculum for teachers? I think it should be. Mm -hmm. It's a very relevant question and it should be. Uh, the, when we talk about, I don't know how many of us are familiar with these terms, we talk about social quotients these days, we talk about emotional quotient. Emotional quotient basically deals with empathy. 
the ability to empathize with the other person, the ability to put yourself in the shoes of the other person and see the world through his or her eyes. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something which is missing. What people go by is usually a sympathetic attitude, mm -hmm. and I think that's quite different from empathy. Mm -hmm. You may sympathize with the person and say, oh my God, he's in pain. Mm -hmm. and, and, but you are not really in those shoes to realize what the person is going through and what context and what networks are playing in his or her mind. Mm -hmm. I think that's the basic difference. And when we talk about emotional quotient, I think it's a need of the hour for everybody. Why just teachers? Mm -hmm. Why not parents? And why yeah. not children from the yeah. very beginning? And I think there's a lot of impetus being laid on that when we talk about life skill education. Mm -hmm and we talk about uh, capacity building, mm -hmm. whether within the educational framework or outside. Sure. And uh, it is also quite rampant and it's something which is picking up very fast even in other organizations, leave aside just the educational sure. organizations. So people are working on those uh, areas sure. where perhaps you can relate to the other person. They are creating those kind of pockets wherein there's a platform to come and speak up your problem. Mm -hmm. Say even in the corporate sector, if you are too pressured, and there, there are some kind of issues coming up from your seniors and there are timelines and you're not able to match them and there's a kind of, some kind of bully, some kind of ragging taking place in some form. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. have a platform to open up without fearing the dire consequences mm -hmm. of what might happen. Mm -hmm. Coming to this issue of, uh, just little two comments on the issue of how to identify those people at risk. Mm -hmm. There are many studies, behavioral studies, there are many biological yes. studies that have taken place People who turn out to be bullies mm -hmm. are the ones wherein there is ineffective parenting, mm -hmm. where there's lack of sensible parenting, where there's a lot of domestic violence at home, yeah. where there's alcohol or drug abuse yeah. and use of all those issues, yeah. where the females at home are not respected as individuals. So all those factors, and, and like uh, the example being quoted where wherein, uh, you know, this child uh, does not respect the mother in the beginning and then later takes pride in, in her being educated. Mm -hmm. I think that's again an example sure. of what kind of uh, dynamics mm -hmm. of, of interaction take place at home environment. Yeah. The other thing is, what, what about the victims? Victims are usually those who, who uh, have a low self-esteem mm -hmm. and perhaps uh, have been threatened to a point that they are, fe they are fearful of opening their mind. Yeah. And they have a temperament where they try to internalize issues rather than externalize. Yeah. So there are two kinds of broad personalities, if I may put it, internalizing and externalizing. Yeah. So whereas we have bullies and people who are perpetrators of crime, who uh, have certain kind of conduct problems, who externalize blame, who try to pull legs of others and enjoy that, mm -hmm. with that due sadism which is happening in the mind, I think that yeah. needs to be curbed there and then. Sure. And as parents, I think we fail in our duty when we do not check our child if the child is making fun of others or, or has begun to enjoy the pain and suffering mm -hmm. of another person. Yeah. And alongside, I think, apart from educational institutes, apart from other organizations, there's a very strong uh, influence of media because that reaches yeah. even the most remotest of places. And I think that's places. the next panel. And so I think that's very, very important. Segue. Wherein, on one hand, I think media can empower Absolutely. And, and bring forth these sensitive issues yeah. in a very sensitive and sensitized manner. Yeah. But the other issue there is wherein you have a hero in a movie, Eve teasing a right. female and, and kind of contributing to this sure. bad thought yeah. process that to, uh, for, for, for a male and that masculine yeah. image, it sure. is absolutely right to kind of sure. enjoy that fun and have that fun of uh, Eve teasing. I think uh, that's so a great, so that's, that's great segue issue. into where we're And then we're this headed. issue of item songs, I think that should be covered in perhaps the next uh, sure. session. Of sure, sure. Yeah. I, I, I know there are many more questions and I apologize for not being able to get to you. I think if you can just catch the panelists during the break. Um, I wanted to thank everyone. I started with the students. I want to end with a message for the students, um, which is that while you're privileged uh, in getting what you're getting at the Sriram school or whichever school you're at, I think there is a responsibility that each of us has. So I yeah, use the phrase of, you know, each one, teach one. And if you can spread this in your own way, whether at home with a staff member or with a friend who doesn't have the same kind of background that you have, or the privilege to attend a school that teaches you about this, please go out and make sure that you make a difference because you have the ability to do that. I'd like to thank the panelists and I'd like to thank the audience. Thank you so much.
you so much, panelists, for that conversation. I'm very glad it ended on the media note, because that's our next panel. And I'm extremely sorry to the audience that we cannot give you the promised tea break on the agenda. What we can do is, while the next panel comes up and is getting mic'd up, you can grab a cup of coffee or tea and just come back. So may I request the next panel, the media panel, to please come up and uh, do the honors. Thank you. <laughs>